This video is made possible thanks to my generous Patreon supporters. You are the IBE to my kitfo. We'd better make it. If the next train doesn't leave for two days. So you're probably wondering how I ended up here. Well, last summer, I visited Ethiopia to meet Kalkadon's parents. And once we'd hit it off, they graciously agreed to take me for a ride on their country's brand new intercity railway. This Chinese-built line stretches 472 miles from the national capital of Addis Ababa to the port of neighboring Djibouti, stopping at Dawa along the way. And while it's only five and a half years old, it's a big part of Ethiopia's plans for local commerce and travel. I always love seeing what trains mean to the places they serve, so I was very excited when we hopped in the car, headed to the Addis Ababa train station. The only thing was, Addis Ababa station wasn't in Addis Ababa. Instead, it was south of the capital, located just over the border in Oromia, the largest and most populous region of Ethiopia. Out here, there wasn't much going on besides a few factories, farms, and small villages. This is the dreamland. We even passed a pickup soccer game in the street just outside the station parking lot. Thuri Lebu Station, the railway's western terminal, is named after the nearby Mount Lebu, and it takes inspiration from traditional Ethiopian architecture, with the flags of Ethiopia, Djibouti, and China flying proudly in front. Like the stations I'd encountered in China a few years back, it featured separate areas for entry, exit, and ticketing, so we made a beeline for the ticket office. One ticket window also had a gospel tract on display, which is definitely something you wouldn't see in a Chinese station. Any last words? <laughs> oh, any last words? Okay. Babu Okay. Babu Tabia. Yes. How are you feeling, Kaki? Ah, uh, nervous. Mm. Nervous because, like, I want to make it on time. Yeah. Running for a train in Ethiopia! <laughs> Caleb forgot his ticket. You were the one who told me to run. Sorry, that's wrong. <laughs> Security personnel rushed us through the mandatory bag screening and pat-downs in the main hall, then we ran out to the platform. Most boarding seemed to be happening in one car, and the door alarms were already ringing, so I followed Kalkadan and her mom down to the crowd. In what I can only describe as a blessing from on high, I somehow started recording video from my pocket as we tried to press our way into the tightly packed crowd of passengers. Okay, New York subway rules. We're on board. That was an experience. Eh, jinx. Still lots of people getting on. Our car featured hard seats in a 3-2 configuration, with most seats facing each other across a small table, the same design I'd seen on China Railways five years earlier. Tickets were also similar to Chinese ones, although printed on thinner paper. Good thing the whole station will stop check-in five minutes before departure thing didn't hold true for us. As a foreign national, my ticket was 216 burr, or about $4 while Kalkadan and her mom, being Ethiopian citizens, were each charged 108 burr, or just shy of $2. Fun fact! For the same cost as a domestic Ethiopian train ticket, you can join my Patreon and get access to bonus content for this video right now. Anyhow, at long last, we pulled out of Furilebu Station, running nearly 20 minutes behind schedule. Now, we wouldn't be riding this train all the way to Djibouti. That would have taken two days. I was primarily in Ethiopia to get to know Kalkadan's family, not to go on lengthy train rides, so we took a cue from my friend Miles Taylor and booked tickets just one stop down the line. From Furi Lebu Station, we would briefly cross the border into the southern bit of Addis Ababa, passing Mount Lebu, before turning south and heading back into the Aromia region. After that, we'd pass the Indode Cargo Terminal, then head southeast to the first passenger station, 31 miles from where we started. This was in a resort town known as Bishoftu in Oromo, the regional language, or Debrezeit in Amharic, the national language. We snaked through the green fields south of Addis Ababa. With hilly views of bright green farmland stretching away before us, it was hard to imagine that we were just south of one of Africa's largest cities. In 2020, over 34% of Ethiopia was farmland, and less than 20% of citizens lived in cities, with many of the remainder living or working on farms like these, growing maize, wheat, and teff, the specialized grain used to make Ethiopia's iconic injera flatbread. I'd actually learned to make this bread myself on my trip, with the careful tutelage of Kalkadan's mom. Many urbanite Ethiopians I spoke to had nostalgia for the country's rural areas. That may be because city dwelling is a relatively recent thing in Ethiopia. It was only Kalkadan's parents' generation that started moving en masse to places like Addis Ababa. We reached a horseshoe-shaped bend in the track, which carried us down a grade and into the nearby valley. It was the rainy season in Ethiopia when we filmed this, and the rains had come hard and fast a few days earlier, so some of the fields we passed were unfortunately flooded. Farmers and pack animals made their way along the road next to the track, 
and I wondered if they had an advantage over trucks and tractors on the uneven, muddy ground. Most buildings along the way were modern, but we spotted a few built in a more traditional style, with mud plastered walls and thatched roofs. These are some of the most iconic symbols of rural Ethiopia, as evidenced by pretty much every Ethiopian music video ever. A row of bright blue bajajoch were parked near the tracks. Bajajoch, singular bajaj, are tiny three-wheeled taxis similar to tuk-tuks in other parts of the world. They're pretty nimble even on rough roads, and they're nice and cheap too, but recent regulations have limited them to three passengers each, any more, and they run the risk of tipping. After spotting a power station for the line, we arrived at Ndode. It was the first point on the timetable, so I'd expected it to be a passenger station, and I'd even planned on us stopping here originally. But it turned out I hadn't done my research because it was only a cargo terminal. <laughs> this station serves as one of several unloading points for freight coming from the port of Djibouti, which is important because a whopping 95% of Ethiopia's trade passes through its more coastally endowed neighbor. Indeed, Djibouti is a big part of how this railway came to be. While the new electrified standard gauge line is less than a decade old, most of its right-of-way has existed for the past hundred years. Ethiopia was never colonized, something Ethiopians will be quick to remind you of, but the bordering country of Djibouti was colonized by France, and they chose to connect their colony with its independent neighbor via a meter gauge railway, using the same route as today's train. This could be part of why today Ethiopians say Farenj, or French, to meet a white person. Beginning construction from Djibouti in 1897, the Ethio-Djibouti Railway was nationalized by the Ethiopian government in 1909, and it reached Addis Ababa in 1917. It would serve the nations faithfully for almost a hundred years thereafter. But today, most of the line is abandoned, with only a small section from Deridawa to the Djibouti border remaining to serve local passengers and goods. The former station in center city Addis Ababa is now a coffee shop and real estate office, and some old train cars are on display there for all to see, along with a modern rail bus of some sort. I never got the story there. We stopped quickly, then we were back on the move again, where I spotted Ethiopian grade crossings, consisting of simple gates over the track. The new line is built to modified Chinese National Railway Class 2 standards, including 25 kV AC catenary and automatic block signaling, as well as grade crossings. In theory, passenger services on the line can reach 75 miles per hour, but ours never did. Our coach had a mildly unpleasant smell, although we couldn't place where it was coming from. And the toilets were apparently closed, something that previous travelers had watched had also reported. As we came closer to our destination, the announcement came that the cafe car was open, and passengers began to flood in its direction. Others chatted loudly and played music as we rode. Kalkadan and her mom explained that most were ethnic Somalis, the predominant ethnicity along the right-of-way in eastern Ethiopia, and they're stereotypically a rather boisterous people who know how to party. Somalis also speak their own language, and a pair of women who interacted with Kalkadan's mom briefly spoke English with her, rather than Amharic, since that was the only tongue they had in common. As far as I could tell, I was the only Farenj riding Ethiopian railways that day, and I found myself stared at quite a bit. A woman sitting next to Kalkadan's mom told us she was traveling to see family in Deridawa. It would take 12 hours for the train to cover the 277 miles there, meaning it would average only 23 miles per hour. The reason? Trains had been striking livestock that had wandered onto the track, or which, our seatmates suspected, had been placed there. Some villagers had also decided to place rocks on the tracks, just for giggles. All of this had led to calls for dramatically reduced speeds, and according to Reddit, disgruntled citizens who didn't feel they'd received fair compensation for their livestock had taken to assaulting trains, leading to the broken windows we'd seen earlier, and causing the cancellation of night trains along this route. I think they spotted the far end on the train. Okay. <laughs> so if the train was so slow and infrequent, why were so many people on it? Well, flying in Ethiopia is expensive, and Ethiopia has one of the lowest rates of car ownership in the world. Bus travel is faster than the railway, but it comes with the risk of crime and terrorism. On the train, federal police officers are stationed throughout, ensuring a safe journey. Additionally, the train allows business people to carry wares between Addis and the eastern cities, with more baggage space than any other mode. After about an hour and 20 minutes of travel, we coasted into the station for Bishoftu, otherwise known as Debrezate. When we stepped off, station staff gave me permission to film the train departing. Our babur consisted of a coach, a hard sleeper car, the cafe car, and two more coaches. Unfortunately, I was never able to get a good shot of the locomotive. Station staff lined up along the platform would pivot to face the train's rear as it passed them. Sound off in the comments if you've ever seen this done before and where. Once silence descended, it was time to walk out of the station and into the sparse expanse that surrounded it. 
Even more so than Furilebu, this station was far from its city center, in the middle of farmland, which Kalkidan's mom thought would make for a great learning opportunity. So there's a farmer plowing his field right across from the station, and Kalkidan's mom's going to ask him if uh, I can have a turn at it? After a few minutes of practice, I felt like I'd got the hang of plowing, mostly. He was trying to be a gabari today, as you can see from the shoes. He this was... is after cleaning it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we also paid this other farmer to let us ride in his cart. After all that, we spent the day relaxing at the nearby Kuriftu Resort, which was, coincidentally, the first place Kalkadon had ever seen a white person as a kid. Then we were serenaded by these guys, and Kalkadon's dad drove us home on the new expressway. We didn't take the train back, because we couldn't. You see, Ethiopian railway schedule is more than a little confusing. But we know all about confusing schedules on this channel. Odd days from Addis Ababa, trains will run to Dere Dawa, westbound leaving from Dere, catch this one on even days. To keep things as they rehearse, no trains will leave the 31st. They should have used the local ways, for each month has just 30 days. If you're going to Djibouti, trains will get there absolutely. Take the schedule to Dere, it keeps on going the next day. The full version of this song is on my Patreon, if you can stand my singing. Anyhow. Ethiopia's new railway is one of many infrastructure projects the country is building as it seeks to better itself over the coming decades. It represents not only a convenient route for freight and passengers to cross Ethiopia's biggest trade corridor, but also the beginning of a larger rail network that the country is planning. And while operation of the line is currently overseen by China Railways, that's over at the end of the year, with everything moving in-house. Ethiopia is slowly but surely trying to become an East African rail titan. It just might benefit from bathroom repairs and more fencing along the tracks to do so. On a more personal note, I realized while filming this that Ethiopians had very little concept of what a train enthusiast was. When I told them that I was going out of my way to film the Intercity Railway and the Addis Ababa Light Rail for next week's video, their reactions ranged between surprised, amused, confused, dismissive, and concerned, as they tried to parse out my strange priorities. But as I spoke to them, particularly middle-aged and older adults, they began to tell me memories they had of riding the old meter gauge railway to buy clothes in Deredawa, recalled the nostalgic sheketef sheketef sounds the trains used to make, told me the story they'd learned in school about a fruit vendor at the Deredawa station, and wished they could make train trips again. Once Kalkadan's mom had been on the Babur, she understood why I was so excited about it, proclaiming that she wanted to take it all the way to Deredawa. And from my research, I learned there's a yard full of abandoned train cars in that city, where if you know the number to call, there's the guy who will take you for a tour of it. So there's at least one of us in Ethiopia. If you're watching this, sir, expect a call from me next time I'm in your country. Thank you everyone so much for watching, and a huge shout out to Kalkadan and her parents for making this whole adventure possible. If you haven't already, consider subscribing and stay tuned for my next Ethiopian adventure. I've come all the way to Africa and they have dots.